Um, so I'm Dan Fluley. I'm um, from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Welsh Data Cube and how that fits in with the Living Wells project. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of background. Um, so Living Wales was established as a research project in 2018 um, under the European Regional Development Fund uh, Sir Cymru programme with support from the Welsh Government. And so the aim was really to look at how Earth observation data and primarily data from satellites, but also some drones as well, um, could be used to characterise, map and monitor um, the national landscape of Wales. Um, so this is you know, to produce a map and then how, how they can be used. Um, so in 2021, it started being moved into the second phase, so Living Wales Phase 2, and that was more into looking at how we can translate that capability from a research project into something that can start being used in Welsh Government and by the various agencies. And we've just started the third phase, which is phase three, and that's really looking at how we can actually move that to more operational system with dedicated support. Um, so I was involved in the second phase and the third phase, so um, Plymouth Marine Laboratory Applications, which is a commercial spin-off of PNL, are looking after that um, operation of the data cube and some of the um, moving that across, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. That's kind of a really high level of overview of Living Wales. So I thought I'd take a little bit of a step back and ask why build a data cube for Wales? So one of the primary reasons is that we need a framework for all these products being generated from Earth observation data as part of Living Wales. So it wasn't just using loads of different software packages, there was some common ambiguity there. And ideally, this should also be used to support Earth observation data in government. So the idea of having this common framework, so the research team at Aberystwyth can be using it, but also people in government can be using the same package. Um, and there's also an international link as well, though. So we're, as part of research we're doing, we're also working with other projects in Australia and Switzerland, and they're using um, data cubes as well. And there's real benefit to collaborating with these organisations because it means we can we use some of their algorithms, we can learn from their shared experiences, we're not having to build everything up from scratch. So in terms of what the overall Living Wales um, system should look like, the what we're kind of aiming for is we've got these um, Earth observation data coming from satellites from various providers, so primarily using the Copernicus series of satellites, so Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and also the um, USGS operated Landsat, um, just because it gives the long time series going back to the 80s. And the idea is that these satellite data, both the archive and newly available scenes when they're required, will be converted to an analysis ready data product. So it's something that people can just start using. And then this will sit as a large archive of data. And this will be indexed into some kind of database that we can pull data out as needed and perform analysis on that. Um, to make different products and export those and also make those available for users. So in terms of the, some of the core technologies um, we're using, it's built around three main core technologies. The first one is EODATA Down, and this is a Python library with a Postgres database. It was written by Pete Bunting at Aberystwyth University, and it's based heavily on RSGIS and some of the other software he's written. And the aim of this is to take data, find data from the different providers, download that data, convert it to an analysis ready data product, um, and then also generate some quick looks and map tiles as well, so it's easy to view those products. And then on top of that, there's a Flask web app, um, which allows data to be searched and also downloaded. So this EODAS down was, um, you written before the project and used for other things, and then we made some adjustments as part of the product in terms of um, how we did that analysis ready data conversion. So for Sentinel-1, we're using Snap as a backend to download the data and um, georeference it, and also to make sure it's in British National Grid. And for Sentinel-2 data, we're downloading the um, atmospherically corrected data straight from ESA. 
rather than doing our own atmospheric correction. And this is just for consistency with other thing, things as well. And it's um, ESA have done a lot of work in their own atmospheric correction, so it allows us to build on that. One of the important things that we do as part of the analysis ready data is we convert it to British National Grid. Um, analysis ready data, there are definitions for it, but actually what it means to different people can sometimes vary. And for using in Wales, actually having something in British National Grid is really important. So you can just drop it in and it lines up with other layers. So that's getting data from the data providers and having a file that's analysis ready data um, ready to do some analysis with and also ready to visualize in a small front end and to view. Um, the second technology we use, um, which a lot of it is based around, is called Open Data Cube. So it's a Python library. There is one main library and then a couple of other libraries around that that do different things. Um, it's open source. Um, it was led a lot by um, Geoscience Australia, but there's also been a lot of other um, contributors to that. And the basic way that works is it has a Postgres database and you every analysis ready data file you have, you index that within the database and then users are able to use this Python library to query the data set and get their data. So that box in the top right just shows an example of the query. So it's essentially in those um, couple of lines of code, you specify the product you want. So in this case, it's Sentinel-2 optical data. You specify the bounding box you want. You specify the time period you want. And then it returns as an X-ray data set, which is quite a common Python library um, for analyzing data. And it has lots of other things built on top of that. One of the nice things about using X-ray is we can use a library called DAS, which allows lazy loading of data, and then you can do parallel processing, you can spin up various worker nodes, so you can actually do some quite large data processing using it. Just an example of some of the large processing we can do. So we had a previous project where we were using Open Data Cube to generate land cover maps for Australia. So using the um, Landsat archive, we generated for the whole of Australia um, at 30 meter resolution, and using 30 years worth of data. So we know this library really can scale to these massive data sets. So actually having that ability to go from small pilot studies to scaling it up is, is really important, really useful. It also allows us to do virtual products. So although we've got the satellite data index, we can have algorithms that compute new products on the fly. And this is quite useful. Um, if we don't want to store every data set. So we could have, for example, a virtual project for different band indices. And then as users load that, it will calculate that and return the data set that they are interested in rather than the raw satellite data. And then the third core technology we use is JupyterHub. So this provides a mechanism of allowing multiple users to have Jupyter Notebooks with a separate environment linked to our storage and with all the different libraries they need installed. So we looked at some different ways of providing that and we settled on um, Zero to Jupyter Hub, which uses Kubernetes. So it's deployed as a Helm chart, if anyone's familiar with Kubernetes, and it's very configurable in terms of the resources and the libraries which people installed. So we use Docker containers to provide a consistent environment for all users. And so we can have all the libraries they need installed. Primarily people are interacting with it with Python because the open data cube is a Python environment, but there is potential to install other things like R within there. It also provides a simple Linux command line. So users can use command line tools as well. They can hit install new packages if they want to. So it actually provides a lot of flexibility and we can provide users with um, compute resources that they might not have on their own local machine as well. So that's, that Jupyter Hub allows them to interact with the open data view and access all that massive archive of data. So there's, I think, about 30 terabyte archive of satellite data and just pull that in and do some work with it. So in terms of the current deployment, how we've currently got it working, um, at the end of phase two, 
We currently have a single server set up within supercomputing Rails, and we're using for EO data down and the EO data down front end. We're using two containerization technologies. We're using Singularity for EO data down, just because it involves using elevated permissions and it's a very HPC way of doing containers. And then the front end, because it's more web, we just use the traditional Docker. To deploy the JupyterHub instance, we're using microcase. And for some of the batch processing, when we need to do larger runs to generate natural scale data sets, we've done some stuff with uh, GMU Parallel. So in terms of getting things running, this is set up, it works. Um, however, we're rapidly outgrowing this single server setup. So we are going to start migrating things away, and I'll go on to that in a little bit. But first, I just want to show some outputs of things that are possible with um, the setup we've been using. So the first is these national land cover maps. And we saw in Paul Stoke mm -hmm. earlier, overlaying some of those. So these are at 10 meter resolution, and for using all available data from a particular year, for every 10 meter pixel, it has the band cover class for those, which is really useful for various applications. But the really interesting thing is being able to look at the change. And having this framework set up, so we've got a pipeline for ingesting new data and indexing it and applying algorithms in a scalable way, means as new data becomes available, we can update these maps. So initiatives such as replanting forests, this gives a tool to monitor the progression of those forests as they go. It also allows us to look if there's areas where land is degrading. So just by having these data sets and being able to update them, it gives us a tool to answer lots of questions and also link it with other data sets as well. So this is land cover. And then one of the things we can do from the land cover maps is we can translate them into habitat maps. So this is um, something that a lot of people want, actually, not just the land cover, the actual habitat classes, because then we can start answering other questions and integrating with, with different frameworks there. Um, another example tool which has been done with this on a, a more regional scale is flood mapping. So I showed the query earlier where you can just select a time series of data and it ends up um, return all the satellites to things within that time series. What's really cool about that is then that means you can apply one algorithm, in this case, to detect floods to that whole stack of data. And it's using sensor one star data, which if anyone's not familiar, it's an active Earth observation sensor that operates at microwave wavelengths, which means it's insensitive to cloud cover, but it is sensitive to slightly different things on the surface. So one of the things is it's sensitive to um, roughness. So where you have flooded areas and the roughness of the surface changes, then that gives a very, very different response. So that can be utilized to map where areas are flooded. So by having all these scenes and being able to quickly analyze those, you can do some quite cool things like produce these maps of water frequency during a particular month for a particular area. And because we've got the whole pipeline of downloading new data and adding new scenes, this can keep being updated as well. So we can look at tracking progress as things happen. And normally there's about a day or so latency between the satellite acquiring a scene and it being available for analysis. So that's a really nice tool of being able to actually monitor things and take these algorithms developed in an archive of data and start applying them as things are actually happening and then getting information out to people. And I know the, for some of the floods that have happened in Wales, um, NRW have been using some of the Centre One data to look at things as well. And sometimes that's just visual, sometimes it's actually doing some analysis. And then the other output which I wanted to highlight, which I think is probably one of the more important outputs, is actually the training material. So it's really great having this good system and people being able to log on it, but actually Doing the material so people can use it is the really important bit. So one of the one of the parts of the project which um, Carol from our Richmond University did a lot of work on is writing these notebooks to really guide people through the process and explain what's happening. 
Um, so the nice thing about digital notebooks is you can have multiple material and you can have images and videos and links to other things. So these notebooks really step through the process of what you can do with this HQ system and um, how you can monitor things. So there is an example of the flood mapping in there and it goes through all the different steps and it tells users change this to set your area, you can change these dates here to set different dates so they can step through those notebooks. And the idea is to go from these large data set of Earth observation data into something that can be, say, added directly into reports. So get a plot at the end that can add it into reports or a CSV file that can be used in Excel. So one of the examples is looking at different areas. So just being able to export that CSV file in Excel and then do the analysis from that, that's really useful, that's powerful, having that whole big data set and condensing it into something that can be used in Excel. There's also the option just to put things in traditional GIS packages as well. So there's an example in the training material of doing a cloud-free mosaic. So taking a time series of data and from there gap filling the clouds. So you just get one image covering a particular area that doesn't have clouds that can then be loaded into a GIS package. And doing that the traditional way of downloading lots of scenes, processing them, analyzing them, that's days and days of work. So being able to do that in a couple of minutes within the notebook, I think that's a really powerful thing. So that's kind of where the project has been and how we've got to. So I'm just going to talk quickly a little bit about future plans. So the aim is to continue in supporting more users. We've already got some people using the system. We've had some good feedback about the material that's there. We've had some problems with performance, as Paul had mentioned. Um, the team at Avarice with are still going to be continuing some of their research to look at new products and as part of that continuing international links. In terms of addressing some of the limitations and scaling it to more users, we've got a plan to move the entire thing from a single server over to Microsoft Azure. And we get two benefits of that. The first is it allows much better separation of resources. So rather than having one server and everything, we can have a separate web for server. We can spin up servers as needed to do the analysis ready data processing. It also means we can scale better to meet user demand. So at the moment, that Jupyter Hub instance, that can only support a finite number of servers and that's of users, and that's turned by the resources of the servers. Whereas when we move to the cloud, we're able to scale. So if we want to run a workshop with lots of users, we're able to add more instances and do that. And we're also able to add um, resources with, say, more CPU or more RAM for more demanding users. And we're also looking to better integrate with data map Wales as well, and looking at how some of the data that have been produced from this can be made available from data map Wales, where there's, there's common links, um, if there's common resources on Azure as well, where we can where we can find common ground on that. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, if there's any questions, let me know. Thanks very much, Dan. That was really uh, really interesting. If there's no questions, we'll um, move on to last session before lunch um, there's uh, we have so much to take in from some of these talks that it'll take a, a second second viewing online maybe but uh, like i said the pdfs and the um the videos will be available okay so i'll let it go in there then. Mm -hmm. Thank you.